Hi, this is Richard Sudlock. Welcome back to the Green Ninja course on climate science. In this episode, we continue our investigations of the Earth system using climate by looking at the climate of the past, which is called paleoclimate. It's a challenging task to estimate or evaluate climates at periods in the past because humans weren't around to keep records or, or measure anything. We care about paleoclimate because understanding it can help us gauge the natural variability of Earth's climate and thus the extent to which changes can be attributed to human activities. For most of Earth's history, no geologists were around to observe or measure climate. To deal with this dearth of information, geologists use proxies. The term proxy has a lot of different meanings. Ones that are relevant to our needs are representative, substitute, surrogate. A climate proxy is a preserved record of the geologic past that scientists use to infer some aspect of the ancient climate, such as temperature. Some commonly used proxies are tree rings, ice, pollen, fossils, in general, pollen is a type of fossil, and diagnostic rock types. Annual growth rings in trees, such as the ones in the top two photos, are familiar to almost everyone. Generally, trees respond to changes in climate by growing faster or slower, usually expressed as thicker or thinner tree rings. Dendrochronologists have learned that some species and some climate changes don't follow the rules. So, as for any scientific endeavor, it's very important to have sufficient training, experience and and the ability to carefully interpret the results. The year in which a ring and a particular tree ring series formed can be deduced by matching patterns in the width, density pattern, or other characteristics that are found in other tree ring series. This kind of cross dating enables us to use tree rings to date specific events such as fires or droughts. can even be used to date the construction of an old building, as in the figure at the lower right. In that figure, three tree ring series are shown, one each from wood in the old building, from a dead tree, and from a living tree. By counting back from known dates in the living tree and cross-dating, in other words, matching the rings from series to series to series, we can deduce the age of the wood in the building. In most climates, tree rings can be used as far back as a few thousand years. Ice is probably the most useful proxy because it's abundant, contains key isotopes, fossil air bubbles, and is as old as a million years. Dozens of ice cores have been drilled from Greenland, and especially from Antarctica. This image shows the locations of two famous drill cores in Antarctica. Vostok, where the record goes back 420,000 years, and Epica Dome C, which goes back 800,000 years. Obtaining ice cores is logistically challenging and impressive. All these structures in this gear are flown in and set up by scientists and technicians. Cores are drilled, pulled out, and sawn into manageable lengths. And at the end of the expedition, they're flown back to a cryo lab where they're stored in freezing temperatures and made available to researchers. The samples show the natural layers in ice. The black layers probably contain volcanic ash from ancient eruptions. The shades of gray probably reflect yearly or seasonal variations. Ice cores provide scientists with proxies for determining ancient conditions of lots of variables. Precipitation, solar variability, forest fires, and all the other ones that are shown here. Our focus here is on temperature, which depends on isotopes. Now, do you really have to know ice, how isotopes are used to analyze ice? I guess not. The process doesn't matter in the sense of being on life's test, but I'm uncomfortable just giving you the numbers as if they come from magic, so bear with this. 
Even though oxygen doesn't undergo radioactive decay, it exists as different isotopes naturally. Uh, chemistry review time, isotopes um, have different numbers of neutrons and thus different atomic numbers, but they're always of the same element. The two most common oxygen isotopes are O16 and O18. And yes, they're pronounced that way, even though they're written this way. It's kind of weird. These two isotopes are present in water in ratios that vary according to temperature. Because O18 is denser, it has two more neutrons, it condenses more readily out of the atmosphere, and thus it's more abundant in higher temperature precipitation. The amount of O16 is higher in precipitation at lower temperatures. Other explanations of this are available in many online sources. Wikipedians might search for Delta O18. The key point is that this is standard, uncontroversial scientific knowledge and procedure by now, and scientists have gotten very skilled at using these isotopes to estimate paleo temperatures, that is, temperatures from past times. Hydrogen is another element with isotopes that are useful to the paleoclimatologist. Almost all hydrogen is H1, but one out of every 6,400 atoms of hydrogen is H2, called heavy hydrogen, or deuterium. It's often abbreviated just as capital D. Scientists are able to estimate paleo temperatures using these two isotopes for the same density-related reasons as in the oxygen isotopes. Besides elemental isotopes, ice also contains tra um, trapped bubbles of fossil air that provide direct physical samples of the atmosphere of the past. Climatologists have learned how to avoid problems with leakage out of those bubbles or contamination of the bubbles by younger air. Combine these and other proxies from ice have been used to reconstruct climate over the last 800,000 years. Although this graph only goes back only goes back to 650,000 years. The top 3 curves show the concentrations of the greenhouse gases nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane in ancient atmospheres. The fourth dark black curve shows the level of deuterium H2. The bottom gray curve shows the level of O18. You can clearly see that higher levels of the greenhouse gases peak at the same time as the peaks in the isotope curves, and these indicate higher temperatures. Now let's look at another type of climate proxy, sediment. Sedimentary particles form, are transported, and are deposited at Earth's surface, where climate happens. Now, most particles aren't affected by climate changes. Your average sand-sized grain of quartz doesn't care if it's cold and wet or warm and dry. It wouldn't show any difference to us when we examine it later in its history. But certain other types of particles are sensitive to climate. Many types of fossils, for instance, are indicative of particular climate conditions. Pollen, which are produced by plants, often provide very helpful data about climate. For example, consider these three maps of eastern North America. They show pollen data collected from lake deposits that were dated at 17,000, 11,000, and 5,000 years ago, respectively, from left to right. KA stands for thousands of years. The larger the circle, the more overall pollen were collected. The redder the circle, the higher the percentage of pollen came from pine trees. The data strongly suggests that over a period of at least 12,000 years, the growth range of pine trees expanded progressively farther north in eastern North America. Climate change is obviously a candidate to explain this pattern. We'll come back to this in a little while. Collected wisdom over the last two centuries has led geologists to conclude that certain kinds of rocks or geological features are diagnostic of certain climate conditions at the time the rocks or features formed. For example, the abundant 
fern, and other plant remains in coal deposits indicate that these materials were deposited in a warm, wet environment, such as a swamp. A second example, deposits of salt and gypsum, which are termed evaporites, must have been deposited in a warm, dry environment where evaporation greatly exceeds precipitation. Modern environments like this include Death Valley and uh, large parts of the Middle East. A third example, a glacier, which is ice in motion, produces a wide variety of distinctive landforms and structures that are well known to geologists. So geologists quite reasonably infer that ancient glaciers produced landforms and structures similar to those produced by modern glaciers. And they use these to map the extent of these cold climate indicators and infer where glaciers used to be. Let's talk about glaciers a bit more. This aerial photograph of part of Antarctica shows two merging glaciers, the Lowry and the Rob. It's just a really cool photograph, huh? But not all of Antarctica is covered with snow and ice. These photographs from modern Antarctica show the edges of glaciers that once used to extend much farther than they currently do. At top left, pieces of a glacier have calved off and floated out to the ocean. At the bottom, the blue and yellow tents are pitched on an area that used to be covered by the glacier. We know this from the smoothed form of the terrain beneath the tents. At top right, the hikers are walking on the, the feathered, thinned down edge of a glacier. It's almost completely melted away. We know this because of the moraine, the big pile of angular boulders to the right of the hikers. It was left behind by the melting glacier. We can find features like smooth terrain and moraines elsewhere in the world, far from modern glaciers and ice sheets. At upper left is a huge moraine in the Sierra Nevada. There's a person wearing some red clothing for scale. There's no glacier currently anywhere nearby. At right is bedrock that was gently smooth as a long departed glacier crossed it. The rocks embedded in the glacier also etched scratches or striations into the bedrock as if it was sandpaper on wood. At bottom left are more striations on a smooth surface, plus an out-of-place boulder called an erratic that was left behind in this weird position by the melting, retreating glacier. By taking an inventory of these features and gathering clues about how long ago the features formed, geologists have figured out the locations and ages of glaciers and ice ages over the last few million years. Here are maps showing the extent of ice in North America at different times over the last 21,000 years. In other words, since the peak of the last ice age. You can see that the ice retreated somewhat between 21,000 and 13,000 years ago, and retreated greatly between 13,000 and 8,000 years ago. In fact, these reconstructions offer us a clear-cut explanation of the pine pollen that we saw in a previous slide. As the ice sheet and colder conditions receded northward, the pine trees followed. While we're on the subject of the last ice age in North America, I want to provide some bonus coverage of a remarkable event that links climate changes with ocean processes. This and the next three slides show snapshots of the ice sheet coverage of North America at different times. Similar to, but more detailed than the images we saw on the last slide. These snapshots come from a sort of flipbook animation that you can download at the URL shown at the bottom of this slide. This slide shows the scene at 18,000 years ago. A continuous ice sheet covered North America from the Atlantic to the Pacific. About 13,000 years before the present, the ice sheet had noticeably started to retreat. An ice-free corridor east of the Canadian Rockies and another one along the Canadian coastline in the Pacific probably provided the routes for humans who were migrating from Asia. But what I want you to really notice here are the abundant lakes that are ponded against the southern edge of the retreating ice sheet. All that ice, all that melting, lots of fresh water that accumulated in any lower-lying areas that were present. 
including the early Great Lakes. Well, shortly after this slide, shortly after 13,000 years before the present, much of the fresh water in these lakes moved rapidly and forcefully into the North Atlantic Ocean via a breakout flow along the edge of the ice sheet. The breakout lowered lake levels in the Great Lakes region, obviously. But what about all that fresh water that entered the North Atlantic in a very short period of time? This slide revisits concepts from our discussions of oceans in a previous episode. The great oceanic conveyor belt brings warm surface waters far north into the Atlantic, warming northern Europe before cooling and sinking below the warmer surface water, and then ultimately moving southward as deep water. But now imagine the scene south of Greenland shortly after the freshwater breakout 13,000 years ago. The breakout added a huge mass of very cold water to the surface waters of the North Atlantic. It would have certainly affected and potentially interrupted the ocean conveyor belt, causing it to slow or maybe even to stop. What, have the, what would have been the effects on climate? Well, without warm surface waters, assuming the conveyor belt had stopped, the temperatures in northern Europe would have plunged. And this is just what happened. On this graph, the time starts at 20,000 years ago on the left and gets younger to the right. The red curve is the average temperature in Greenland over that time. About 13,000 years ago, temperature dropped by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit within a very short time span, perhaps as short as 100 years or even less. This event is shown within the blue oval. The temperatures were as cold as they had been at the peak of the Ice Age 20,000 years ago, and they stayed cold for over a thousand years during what's called the Younger Dryas event. But then, about 12,000 years ago, the temperatures shot up at least as rapidly, by about 12 degrees Fahrenheit. This event is shown within the Green Oval. A popular, but not unanimous, hypothesis to explain this is that the abrupt drop in temperature happened because, that's the thing outlined in the blue there, that happened because the ocean conveyor belt was interrupted by that influx of fresh water from glacial North America. The temperature abruptly increased a thousand years later when the ocean conveyor belt was finally able to reestablish itself after choking on all that fresh water. The warming of Greenland resumed, reaching its currently balmy average of minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit by about 10,000 years ago. Now again, this hypothesis hasn't yet been fully accepted, but it's quite popular among scientists who study this problem. Whatever the cause of these temperature changes, it's clear that Earth is capable of abrupt, significant changes in temperature on its own, even without interference by humans. This is one of the major contributions of paleoclimatology to our understanding of Earth's climate system. And that's the end of episode 19.